Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Physics for Society, the fourth in our series, Working in the U.S., Career Development for International Physicists. My name is Alex Adams, and I'll be the moderator for today's event. APS webinars are a free service of the Society, and this series is brought to you by APS Careers in the Office of International Affairs. Our next broadcast, Scientific Collaboration Across Borders, will be held in November with a final event on scientific diplomacy in December. We encourage you to sign up for the APS webinars mailing list at the URL found on your screen. APS membership provides benefits for physicists around the world with access to valuable information and resources, including career guidance materials, mentoring programs for industrial physicists, and many other opportunities. Members can network with a global physics community through APS meetings and through APS unit involvement. If you haven't done so already, we do encourage you to consider joining APS today at the address on the screen. APS is an international organization and nearly a quarter of its membership lives outside of the United States. To expand opportunities for students, APS offers free one-year memberships for students worldwide. APS engages globally with physicists through organizing webinars like this series and other webinars with partner societies abroad on topics such as publishing in peer-reviewed journals and diversity and inclusion topics. APS also hosts forums and conferences for young physicists, such as the International Young Leaders Forum, as well as the Canadian American Mexican Graduate Student Physics Conference. APS advocates for scientific mobility, and there is a strong international presence at both APS meetings and in APS journals. Visit the link on the screen to see more, including a mapping tool that shows how APS engages with physicists in your region. And for a little housekeeping, I wanted to point out um, today's presentations will be followed by a questions and answer session with the speakers. If you have a question during the presentation, please type those questions in the Q&A panel, which you'll find on the lower right hand side of your window. You'll also find a live transcription button that'll allow you to turn on closed captioning for this event. Today's presentation is being recorded. And we aim to post a recording of this within five business days to the APS webinars website. We also ask that as you're leaving the webinar, you complete the post event survey and share your feedback on today's event. And with that, let's get started. Our first speaker today is Ravi Kuchamanchi. Ravi obtained a bachelor's in technology in engineering from the Indian Institute of Technology, Mumbai, and a PhD in physics from the University of Maryland. Ravi founded the Association for India's Development, AID, and after his postdoctoral work, began to focus his attention on human rights and so social justice issues in India, such as renewable energy, sustainable livelihoods, and struggles of marginalized people. Ravi has been interested in the axionless solutions to the strong CP problem, and in his 2015 paper in the journal Physical Review D, Ravi provides a way to test if parity is a good symmetry of nature, even if the parity breaking seesaw scale is well beyond collider reach. Next, we have Professor Christian Galbiati. Christian performed his studies in physics at the University of Milan, graduating in 1995 and obtaining his dottorato in 1999. He has been with the Department of Physics at Princeton University since 1999, where he rose through the ranks from postdoc to full professor. Christian started his research with the study of low energy neutrinos at the Borexino experiment at Laboratori Nazionale de Gran Sasso, an effort which now spans 27 years. He was one of the pioneers of the use of liquid argon with the warp experiment, Christian founded the Dark Side Collaboration, led, dark side, led the Dark Side 50 Dark Matter Search, and launched the Dark Side 20K program, the most ambitious search for high mass dark matter under construction. 
He launched and led the MVM project for the development of pulmonary ventilators in response to the COVID-19 pandemics. And with that, I'll hand it over to our first speaker. Go ahead, Ravi. Hi, thank you, Alex. Uh, thanks to APS for uh, inviting me to participate in this discussion. Uh, so I begin by uh, saying that, uh, you know, as this is, we tend to ignore human beings in actions, uh, but society is a part of this physical world. Uh, and therefore, uh, we as physicists probably have a deep role to play in it. Uh, when we think about problems of physics, uh, then Feynman tells us that, you know, the idea of physicists are not working on things that is already known, right? We have checked the laws that are known and we don't keep rechecking them. So the, uh, the cutting edge work is, uh, is in the, are in the challenges, like for example, the challenge of unifying gravity with other forces or uh, a quantum theory of gravitation challenges in cosmology or condensed matter physics. So, so we work on these big challenges. So as physicists, when we look at, at what we can do for the society, we have to look at the bigger challenges of the society. And of course, one of the big challenges in the society today is, uh, uh, is climate change or cli climate catastrophe. There are also more historic challenges in the society. For example, even today, almost a billion, uh, peop more than a billion people sleep hungry over, all over the world, and, and these include children. And this is at a time when our farmers are able to produce much more than what is needed for the entire population. And still, there are billions of people who are sleeping hungry. So when you look at a problem like this, you might think that a solution is that, well, there are a lot of people who have a lot of excess food or excess resources, and there are these have-nots. And one possible way of solving the problem is to take food technology or other resources and transfer them from the haves to the have-nots. So you, it might appear that that's a solution. But when you look at the people who are facing, who are struggling with these problems, and you look at human rights activists and social workers, what they'll tell you is that actually the reason that there are have-nots is because resources have been take, grabbed from the have-nots by the haves. And, and actually the value has flown from have-nots to haves historically, and they have not been compensated for, uh, uh, you know, for their work or given due dignity in the work that they have done. So then as a physicist, uh, you'll find this very remarkable because this theory actually explains why you have have-nots and haves. Why, and, and then you also begin to see why the original solution of just taking resources from the haves and giving to the have-nots will have a very limited application and it won't really solve the problem if the resources are actually flowing the other way around. So, so then you think, well, oh, wow, these uh, social workers and human rights activists, they're doing some very interesting work. Uh, let's spend more time with them. And I was reading uh, you know, yesterday an article uh, that talked about a farm worker in India. She earns about $2 a day, but the article went on to say, to, uh, to work on other people's fields. And the article went on to say, there are some days when she has to work in other, other households in, the, in her village, and she's not even paid for her work in those days. And that can happen if the upper household is of a higher caste, the other household is of a higher caste, and she is from a lower caste. So if there's a death or a function in the upper caste family, then lower caste people are expected to work in their homes for free. And, uh, and, and, this, and so if you ask a social worker in India, they'll say that unless uh, the traditional caste system in India, which actually treated uh, the so-called lower caste in India uh, as, as underprivileged and have exploited them, that has to be fought before she can get out of her poverty. Then the other thing is that the daily wage that she gets of $2 a day, it's half the wage that men doing uh, the same kind of work are earning. That's because the daily wage rate for women uh, who are doing uh, basic manual labor in India is about half the rate of men. And then you begin to see that for her to get out of this situation, she has to fight the forces of exploitation. And this is the language that uh, social workers will use, that she's oppressed, there are forces of exploitation, there, are, there is bonded labor and things like that. 
And for a physicist, this is very interesting because this is like, to me, when I first realized these things, it was like the Newton's laws, that there are forces that they are holding in this system. And those forces have to be fought before the system can move to another state. Now, coming back to Newton, one of the things that Newton did, of course, is to say that, you know, the projectile of a ball, if a ball is thrown on the earth, the curved path that the ball takes and the curved path that the earth takes around the sun, the cause is the same or the planets take around the sun. They are both attracted by the same gravity. So he kind of unified the celestial bodies and the earthly bodies as being subject to the same law. And this pursuit of unification in physics uh, has proved very useful, like, uh, you know, like all several particles are, are seen as symmetry components of each other. And there's basically, you, uh, you know, they are, you would see that they are basically the same in some sense. And there is one force or just a few forces acting on them. Now, coming back to the society after the medieval periods, when, uh, you know, after the French Revolution uh, and the Declaration of Independence, there is, a, there is the idea that all men are created equal. And there is the idea, and today you would interpret that as all human beings, regardless of their gender, their sexual orientation, caste, creed, nationality, uh, uh, religion, they are created equal. So, so there is this higher ideal that is uh, put out there and laws of many democracies, whether Western or, uh, or, or in developing nations are motivated to reach, uh, the progressive laws are motivated to reach that idea. And so this idea of unification that you find in physics, uh, you know, determining the laws of physics, it is the same idea of unification of treating all human beings equally that you, you, you begin to see uh, to see in the in the society. Now, as physicists, we know that okay, the law may be you know all good and treat everybody equally, but the state of the system uh, is uh, the system could be stuck in a state in which that law is not visible. In other words, uh, that law is broken or hidden in the actual ground state of that system. For those who are physicists in the audience, you can just think of a potential energy curve that is symmetric about let's say the y-axis but it has minimum all along the x-axis and you could be stuck in one of those other minima uh, and not at x equal to zero or the minimum at x equal to zero and then at the other minimum that symmetry is not reflected. So, so physics are routinely used uh, to the idea of the laws being, uh, you know, uh, uh, higher laws being symmetric, but the system being stuck in an extremely asymmetric state. And now when you look at the society with this insight, uh, you begin to realize that uh, uh, for uh, for this farm worker in India, or or, or for uh, or, or for if you, uh, or, or to make a change, you are actually though the ideal is though the laws of countries are improving uh, to reach this higher ideal, the system yet is, is stuck in this asymmetric state. So you have, for example, black people in the U.S. saying that there are more police atrocities committed against them than than on the white people. And you have this case that women, though the law in India might say that women and men should be paid equal wage, the market is determining that uh, that actually men are being paid more than women for a similar kind of job that they are doing. So the system is caught in a highly asymmetric state. So these kind of insights help uh, physicists. Uh, uh, they are bring, uh, physicists can bring these kind of insights to human rights work. And uh, one of the things you'll see is that economists, are, of course, are talking about social problems a lot. And so you may have this idea that there, uh, an economist that might write the book saying that there is a fortune at the bottom of the pyramid, but a physicist would, uh, would realize that if this is the nature, if there are forces holding uh, this farm worker in India in that minimum that she's stuck, which is at an asymmetric point, then the moment she tries to get out, there are forces of oppression that brings her back to that minimum. And to go from that minimum to this higher state of symmetry, where all men are created equal and there is equal or all people are created equal and there is equal opportunity, you have to go through a lot of potential barriers. And, uh, and so as a physicist, you'll have a much greater insight that to really create an economics that works uh, for the underprivileged, it's not about only profit being driven by a motive of profit being at the end of the, at the bottom of the pyramid. Uh, a lot more needs to be done. Uh, so I'll, uh, I'll close by an example. When I went back to India, one of the uh, social activists in India was very renowned, Medha Parker. 
Uh, she basically said that when there's a dam being built, uh, you know, near our villages and about 245 villages are going to be submerged by this dam. And uh, the tribal people or the indigenous communities uh, and the farmers who are being displaced by this dam, they are saying that a lot more water will enter their, uh, their villages than the engineers are saying. So you are a physicist, you prove the engineers wrong. And, and the village people write uh, that there's going to be much more submergence than what is estimated is the problem she gave me. So when I went to these uh, villages, I was extremely skeptical. How would a village person who does not even know how to read and write, where the highest school is only the fourth grade and that too only recently, uh, how would they uh, know uh, actually meaningfully as scientists or uh, convince me that they have a case? So I asked uh, in these villages, how do you know uh, that the water will come more. And they told me that, you know, we know our river. So when this river Narmada rose in the floods in 19, this happened, they pointed to me place the village which had, which the river it had brought in garbage from outside and dumped there and then receded. And they said, since these do not belong to our village, nobody has touched them and they have left there. And that was the marker for where the, uh, to the level which, which this river rose in the 1970s. As a physicist, I suddenly realized that these people have a system of measuring heights from the river. While the engineers had marked all of these uh, villages with heights from the mean sea level, as is usually in engineering in India. So every place, the houses, the rivers are marked with heights above MSL, above the mean sea level. They are using two coordinate systems. The village people are measuring heights from the river and, uh, and this is from the, uh, from the sea. And the sea is hundreds of miles away. It's not even visible there. So as a scientist, you realize like what is that? That in different coordinate systems, the problems look simpler uh, for a particular area of study. And the river seemed to be a very good coordinate system to use to measure heights. So I was very interested and I verified, I mean, I was still skeptical as a physicist, I verified that in a village which is not in eye contact with this village, there was another marker they gave me about the 1970 floods and that the two matched uh, with the theater light I was carrying, I was able to match that those two levels matched. And so uh, to, to like a centimeter accuracy. And this was astounding. Uh, so of course, then later on, uh, uh, you know, like sitting in that river, then I was wondering now, how, how, how do I prove now that the village people have a case? Uh, the river uh, was like a swimming pool, which was 50 kilometers long by that time, uh, because the dam had already been partly built and there was already water and it was monsoon. And so I realized that this was a geodesy, right? This was a flat surface carrying the same level everywhere, the top of the water. Uh, and uh, I, and uh, so, so it, it tracked the gravitational field of the earth. Uh, and, and so, uh, so, so it, it was level. So the level of the river uh, at the village and the dam site should be the same. And the level at the dam site that the people had put at the village that the people had put up where I was, it was showing that the water was flowing above the dam. It was monsoon, the dam was incomplete and the water was going over it. So I did a back of the envelope calculation to figure out how long it would take the river to empty itself because I knew the total flow in the in a year, how much volume of water would be there in the year. And I knew the cross-sectional area and I could figure out the, the thing. And I was predicting that in one week, the height of the river would fall, but it didn't fall. And I waited another week and it didn't fall. And then the physicist in me knew that the government's markings are in error because the river height was not falling. And then we went and checked that the height of the same river which is like a swimming pool was different according to government's own marking at the dam site and, uh, and at this place, while actually the geography of the riverbed was so low from, from there to the dam site that it was almost horizontal. Uh, and that's how we exposed the problems with, the, uh, you know, with, with what the engineers were saying. And I found that the collaborators in these tribal villages and human rights activists to be extremely strong on science uh, they, I mean, they have their way of, uh, you know, making statements and figuring out what the truth is. And this has been my experience over and over again, that whether uh, they are fighting, uh, you know, pollution by, uh, by factories or corporate greed or uh, state negligence, um, the activists really have very truthful, if they do not have the truth, if they are not carrying the grain of truth, they would already be suppressed. 
they would already be uh, they would not even be there because the forces to uh, uh, suppress them are so strong and and yet uh, when climate change activists or when human rights activists they are uh, raising issues they are uh, they are founded on a, a, a lot of value of truth uh, and and and, um, and so i'll stop now and i'll invite uh, cristiano to continue and maybe we both can come back with questions but i wanted to give you an insight of of this is working on human rights issues Thank you, Ravi. My name is Cristiano Gabbiati. I'm a professor at Princeton University, and I will uh, talk to you about a different experience, uh, how we turned uh, a collaboration uh, that was working uh, on a project uh, for basic science for dark matter into an active collaboration uh, working uh, in uh, different issues and uh, significantly in uh, developing uh, a ventilator for prompt response to COVID. Do you see my screen? I hope so. So the, the title of uh, this beer presentation is From Dark Matter to COVID, the MVM, the Me Mechanical Ventilator Milano. We are operating a collaboration which is called the Global Argon Dark Matter Collaboration, which is over 400 scientists busy with building uh, uh, a very uh, ambitious program, which is the Darsai 20K program for dark matter searches. Our goal is to extend the current uh, uh, sensitivity for the dark matter search at high mass uh, from the limits of the xenon-based experiment using a very special source of argon, an argon that is depleted in argon-39. To go to the uh, neutrino floor, which is uh, the gray area, which is uh, essentially the last boundary where you can discover dark matter before there is an onset of a background uh, coming from uh, uh, neutrinos, especially from neutrinos that are generated uh, uh, by cosmic rays. So we have this big collaboration, which is busy in this project, and it's building uh, these uh, gigantic detectors, 700 tons of argon, uh, 50 tons uh, of uh, argon, which is very special because it's depleted isotopically in argon-39. And it's busy making plans to install the detector in the largest underground laboratory in the world, which is the underground laboratory of Gran Sasso in central Italy. When the COVID strikes, <clears throat> and uh, during those days I am in Italy, which is uh, the country in the Western world, uh, which is uh, affected first uh, in a massive way by the COVID. So we decided to develop uh, a ventilator just because uh, we knew how to deal with gases. You know, we had a long experience in dealing with gases for the dark matter project. And we had hundreds of people that were from uh, the night to the day uh, forced to stay at home and forced to make very significant changes in their lifestyle and in their research project. So this effort was quite successful, was uh, the project that, that went the fastest from conception to the emergency use authorization from the FDA, and it was eventually certified also in Canada and in the European community. The key features, uh, you know, certainly oxygen control, uh, the two most common modes of ventilation, pressure control ventilation and pressure support ventilation, those are the two modes of ventilation that are necessary if uh, a patient affected by the COVID lands uh, in intensive care unit and is put uh, on a ventilator intubated. And uh, a very delicate control of the positive end expiratory pressure, namely the pressure at which you maintain the lungs of the patient above uh, the atmospheric pressure. That is one of the main functions of the ventilator. You don't let the alveoli collapse totally. You keep them a little open at the end of the ventilation cycle with a small over pressure so that you uh, uh, diminish the fatigue that is on the alveoli of the patients. So we started out in March of 2020 to design this ventilator. And uh, the idea was to keep it as simple as possible to make a system that uh, could be uh, open sourced, uh, at least uh, as a concept and uh, copied in uh, as many sp as possible ways. Uh, the system is indeed extremely simple. It's uh, composed by a limited number of uh, pressure sensors and valves with an extremely, extremely simple system. And uh, of course, oxygen sensor also for the monitoring of the oxygen. 
and equipped uh, with all the standard uh, patients, uh, hoses and masks uh, that are typical uh, for the environment of the intensive care unit for the intubation of patients. It was a very intense uh, project and very short in time, the initial development of the ventilator. We started on March 23, the uh, project officially, and on May 1st, uh, we obtained in uh, less than 45 days uh, emergency use authorization from uh, the uh, Food and Drug Administration. The unit is extremely simple. It's uh, a metal box containing uh, a controller, which is the main unit uh, in charge of the control of the critical features uh, of the uh, ventilation, a supervisor, which serves, uh, it's a small chip, which serves uh, to monitor the most critical parameter. And it's a fail-safe system to monitor the most critical parameter. And then there is another unit uh, which is uh, handling uh, essentially the uh, interactions with the users. Uh, there is an input, the air coming from the gas blender from the hospital system, and there is an output, the air going to the patients, and there are several uh, lines uh, to monitor the pressure at the patient port uh, and in other points. Uh, this was an initiative with a very significant uh, broader impact uh, of the uh, research that is funding in the US by the US National Science Foundation and by the Department of Energy and uh, in Italy by INFN and in, in Canada by the Canada Foundation for Innovation and ANSERC. We mounted a very large collaboration with a very good fraction of people coming from the dark side global urban dark matter community. And uh, we mounted a very strong cooperation with the industry. Our uh, key factor was to realize immediately that uh, it was not sufficient to work only with researchers. We had to open up early on uh, the effort to an industry that would implement uh, the project and help uh, guide us uh, through the very uh, stringent standards uh, that are uh, enacted uh, for the deployment and construction of these uh, critical care units. So the goals were to be safe, uh, very effective on patients affected by COVID-19 without building a machine that uh, had the pretense to work also for uh, people that were sedated for various surgical procedures. Uh, we focused just on COVID-19. Rapid mass production, low build cost, uh, and suitable for use in intensive care unit for the COVID-19 patients, and also ease of training. As I said before, it was one of the most intense uh, efforts that have been part with, certainly the most intense research effort that have been part with. We started on uh, March 1920 with the first concept, the real start of the work was March 23. By April 19, we were uh, having the first series production units in Italy. May 1st, uh, we obtained uh, the FDA emergency use authorization. We were the fastest of uh, several tens of efforts uh, uh, that were pursued by research groups. May 22nd, there was a significant contract issued by the government of Canada to a company in Canada that adopted our standard. We submitted the material for certification on July 30th, and uh, we had an interim order approval in Canada on September 30th, and full certification on November 30th, which led to the start of production. And eventually we delivered 7,300 ventilators for the Canadian stockpile. So I believe it was probably the only one or one of very few research driven efforts that made it the true production. And here you can see the ventilator was actually working and uh, you know, working very nicely. It passed all the tests uh, for qualification, not only in the US, uh, but also in the Canadian and the, in the UK uh, system. And uh, it's a small example of how uh, basic research can be of uh, benefit to the greater society, because it really showed how having a group of uh, scientists that were uh, busy with a basic research project uh, and uh, very interested in what they were doing in uh, dealing with gases, uh, really put them in a condition to uh, make an impact in something which is important for the broader society when the time came and the emergency came of the COVID-19. So I'm glad to have been part of this effort, which has been uh, extremely positive and extremely interesting for us. And uh, with this one, uh, I thank you for uh, your attention.
and I give back to the word to the organizers uh, of the of the webinar. Thank you very much, Cristiano. I want to thank both of our speakers today. Um, and let's go ahead and move toward our Q&A session now. Um, and before I lead into our first question, I want to encourage our participants to go ahead and submit any questions you may have in that Q&A box. Um, so let's start with the first question I've got here for Ravi. Do you find that the indigenous communities with which you have worked have specific knowledge that you as a scientist were not aware of or familiar with but that informed or improved your work. That is, often scientists are perceived as the experts, but the indigenous communities have valuable knowledge that can inform science and scientists. Oh, looks like you're uh, muted right now, Ravi. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that uh, that's a great question, and uh, uh, and and communities of people know their local surroundings, uh, you know, much more than uh, than we do. Uh, so uh, uh, so the local knowledge, and uh, and also how to live uh, a sustainable life, is much uh, and with a close connection to the environment, to the forest, and the natural resources. Uh, it's very strong in indigenous communities, and oftentimes in India, you can you call them natural resource-based communities too, uh, because they live much closer to nature than, than we do. Uh, I give you one example of how you know they had water in Narmada uh, without even to keep those because they and they they realize the significance of it, uh, you know, for their struggle. Uh, uh, and uh, there have been other uh, instances, for example, in another village, we were involved in work where we built a, a, a micro hydro system to, uh, to generate electricity for that village, because what was happening was that though that village was going to be submerged by the larger dam parts of it, uh, the electricity from the dam was not going to these villages which were in the submergence zone, it was going to go to the cities in India, uh, which is again the inequitable uh, distribution of how uh, energy is used. Uh, so, so we built a standalone uh, system. That village had a beautiful waterfall, and we tapped the energy of the waterfall to light up that village. So here again, the local uh, people's knowledge about where we are, uh, whether what we are building now would uh, displace trees, forests, uh, or uh, you know, was also of the uh, was also important, and and also where we had to place our equipment so it's not submerged by a sudden high tide. Uh, or a or a high flow of water that happens there, so so we had to take uh, inputs from the indigenous community. Uh, oftentimes, uh, I think medicinal herbs, uh, herbs like are uh, are known to indigenous communities and to farmers in India, and uh, and there are many. I, I mean, I have not done that personally, but there are many activists in India who work with people uh, to uh, keep the knowledge alive of you know how many varieties and grains of rice for example there are uh, because uh, uh, because after the green revolution there's only certain varieties that are propagated or promoted but traditionally uh, villages in india and africa will have a lot more varieties and that biodiversity is lost so the biodiversity uh, the value of uh, the uh, the herbs uh, these these are the kind of things that indigenous communities I find uh, know much better than we do. Thank you very much, Ravi. Um, the next question I have here is uh, for you, Christian. Christian, uh, do you run it? Did you run into certain issues that made it particularly easy or difficult to mobilize your ventilator project so quickly, especially given? Uh, the COVID slash pandemic situation? You know, mobilizing was very easy because uh, everyone was very eager to help uh, in those days, both uh, for a humanitarian reason and also because they were stuck at home. So it was very easy to get a very large cohort of people happy to help remotely. We had uh, calls in the first few weeks where we had really hundreds of participants. Uh, calling in from every country. It was more difficult to get people 
working directly at the company where we started doing the prototyping because we were in a very tight lockdown in Italy, but we managed to find a sufficient uh, number of people. So it was very easy to mobilize uh, people, I have to say. We got a very big response. Um, and just a follow up on that question. Did you work with any partners in developing nations um, in, in developing the MVM? There were a lot of people actually calling in from India and providing uh, uh, um, providing support from India. So we, we particularly appreciated that. Fantastic. Um, I believe this one is for either of you or both of you, if you'd like to answer. Um, are you aware of efforts by other physicists or scientists in other fields to use their scientific knowledge to address societal issues? If so, can you give an example? I mean, one, yeah. the one example that I see is uh, that there are a lot of physicists that, that have really helped uh, step up the analysis of the data on COVID. Uh, and uh, you know, what I've seen in uh, Italy, for example, is a very significant role of a few physicists whose name is recognized in educating the population about the risks for COVID and the importance to uh, step up measures of uh, control of the virus spread uh, and in convincing people okay, that this was not a hoax, was real, and that the measures of uh, social distancing and vaccinations are truly important. So I think that has been something that has been you know, a really fantastic role and highlighting of the role of the physicists. Yeah, I, I can also add to that, uh, you know, uh, see, I, I think that uh, it might appear that this is a road less traveled for physicists, but oftentimes when you go on the road less traveled, you find that there's a lot of traffic on that road. So, so I think a lot of, uh, you know, people who have done physics or continue to do physics or other sciences, uh, you will find that many of them are involved in, uh, in you know, interesting ideas and collaborations uh, that uh, help the society, whether it is, for example, I, uh, we are working with a group uh, that is building, uh, uh, that's helping uh, uh, salt workers uh, in, uh, in, in Kutch, uh, in Western India, uh, to replace their diesel pumps with uh, solar panels and the solar pumps. Uh, and and it, it's phenomenal how much water uh, just traditional salt workers pump every day. Uh, you know, just uh, just from just below the ground, uh, saline water, and then spread it out so that it dries in the sun, and then they can collect the salt and sell it. Uh, and the amount of diesel it takes, and how much uh, you know, how well the solar equipment works for them, uh, you know, and and how to facilitate that. This is, for example, and and just like with solar energy and wind energy, there are a lot of uh, you know uh, people working on those issues. There are people working on, uh, I mean, this is a little bit of a controversial field for scientists, but on uh, the impact of genetically modified foods uh, and the push by the food industry to, uh, you know, to uh, promote, uh, you know, food crops that kind of remove the ownership of seeds from the farmers and give it to corporates. Uh, and uh, that coupled, uh, the politics of that coupled with the questions surrounding consumption of genetically modified food. And, and there are a lot of scientists, you know, working in, in, in this area. So there are, there, there are also, there have also been, and there are also a lot of insights. I know, for example, a mathematician from Institute of Mathematical Sciences in India, Ramanujam, and he was in my early days when I was a graduate student. When he gave a talk, he was telling us uh, how it may be harder to transform uh, to, for example, he was at that time working on the total literacy campaign in India. It was to, uh, to teach adults in Indian villages how to read and write. And he said sometimes a goal of a total literacy for the entire village reading and writing, all the adults might be easier to achieve than just picking one adult and saying this adult must learn how to read and write. Because there will be, because as he said, there's a critical point that is reached and uh, it's almost like a phase transition that happens. So the dynamics of working with large numbers was what he was pointing out to as opposed to uh, working with small numbers comes into play. So there are scientists who, you know, who have worked on these things and they have, and mathematicians, and they have, uh, you know, they have offered a lot of insight after they've done, uh, after they have worked through what it meant for them.
Thank you very much. Um, the next question I have here is for Ravi. Um, is there a growing body of research that implements physics concepts to society? If so, what precautions do you need to take, or do you think need to be taken to avoid removing the role of personal agency when looking at systems of people? Okay, uh, I'm not sure I understand this question completely, but I think today probably the dangers of computer science, artificial intelligence and biosystems probably outweighs <laughs> the, what harm physics can do. It probably already has done the harm. If uh, your question was in that direction as to how, uh, you know, how the research of scientists, uh, uh, how, how there should be a cautionary, you know, step uh, before uh, it, it produces harm to the society. Uh, so, so, so I do think that, uh, of course, energy is still like a big physics issue. I mean, and uh, you know whether fission reactor, uh, whether you know current reactors which are based on fission rather than fusion, whether they should be used because of uh, because they would counter global warming or climate change. But then they have other uh, impacts. Uh, and whether you know and fusion energy, though there has been some significant progress reported lately, uh, is still uh, and that would be very safe. It's still like you know. Uh, far, uh, you know, from being real, real. Uh, but uh, but yeah, I think that uh, that uh, the dangers coming from computer science in terms of how data is used, how artificial intelligence is used, and how the combination of biology and uh, and computer science would work uh, is probably much more today than uh, coming from physics. Fantastic, thank you. Um, we have another question here for you, Christian. Um, is your project applicable in underdeveloped countries or is it only being utilized in the West? It turns out uh, that uh, the, the client that bought uh, these ventilators, which is the government of Canada, ended up over ordering ventilators, not only ours, but also you know, they ordered the uh, from uh, several different efforts and several different companies and they have uh, an excess of the ventilators in their uh, stockpile and I know that they are uh, in discussion with the uh, Center of Disease Control of the African Union which is an intergovernment body in Africa to make a very large donation of these excess ventilators uh, to, to the CDC of the African Union. Africa Union. Fantastic. And another question here for you again, Christian. Um, you mentioned seeing a lot of physicists underlying research slash efforts related to responding to COVID. Are there areas where you see the dearth of physicists or oh, see a dearth of physicists or areas where we need researchers to focus on? <laughs> Sorry, let me reread that. Um, you mentioned seeing a lot of physicists underlying F research and efforts related to responding to COVID. Are there areas where you see a dearth of physicists or areas where you need, where you see a need for researchers to focus on that particular topic? Um, you know, what I've seen that has been useful is not uh, so much a very large number of physicists, but I think, uh, you know, what has been uh, useful in Italy is to have a few very well uh, known physicists uh, speak out loudly on the decision to counter the fake news about the COVID, the fake news about the vaccine and so forth. Now, for example, one person that uh, has been extremely effective uh, is uh, Giorgio Parisi, who's uh, the recent Nobel Prize in Physics announced a few weeks ago. I would say that in the one and a half years uh, up to getting the prize, he was one of the most vocal persons from the science community on this COVID issue and, uh, you know, he always made very sobering uh, statements and very sobering uh, interventions to guide uh, the public opinion uh, in the right direction. So if I, if I may just add on the point of uh, COVID, uh, I think one of the, you know, big issues in which uh, a contribution is needed, for example, in a country like India is in the, just in the number of deaths that happen. Uh, there is a lot of undercounting in many countries in the world of the amount of COVID deaths. 
uh, and maybe that undercounting is much lesser in the Western countries, but uh, it's definitely a lot there in India. Uh, a journalist from uh, you know Chennai, she did some uh, some groundbreaking work where she found that the excess death data of uh, you know the COVID years compared to the non-COVID years is showing about 2.5 million COVID deaths in India, while uh, our government is reporting just a few lakhs of deaths so far. Uh, a few hundred thousand deaths, while actually the excess death data according to her is showing 2.5 million deaths. So, so I think uh, you know uh, that kind of uh, the the data there is a significant issue about uh, in developing countries about uh, how uh, data is uh, you know used and and how data is actually uh, uh, like whether the data is good or if somebody speaks the truth, then you know then there could be the government may not like it or vested interests may not like it and how, how how the voice is suppressed so so this is an unfortunate problem which is of great significance in india currently because we do have a government that seems to be uh, you know like seems to be at war with its own people in some sense it's an extremely divisive government we have currently and uh, uh, and uh, and basically suppression of data not only on covid but also the truth on several other things is something that uh, the state uses to control uh, to control society and to control uh, dissenting voices in the society. But as scientists, we know that the feedback is important because knowing the truth uh, uh, is actually what leads to progress and uh, curtailing the truth actually leads to a regression. I mean, you won't get to that uh, you know beautiful point of equal opportunity for everybody. Uh, that unifying point if you don't uh, take the feedback from people. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, we have another question here for Christian. How did you get a company on board to produce this technology? Uh, I, I called around. Basically, I had the idea because uh, I knew a person working in a gas company. They made a big donation to an hospital that was being built in Milan to treat COVID patients. They built the entire gas distribution system, but he complained to me that uh, they were unable to get ventilators because they had placed an order and the order had been sequestered by another government because there was shortage of equipment. So I said, let's do something. The day after I was uh, in his uh, shop because uh, they are a gas company, but they also service ventilators. So I did the first experiments in his shop, but then it was clear that we needed a company that was in the building, in the, that was in the business of building uh, electromedical devices for uh, for the medical devices uh, market. And so I just called around and I found uh, one uh, company. The owner was a sole owner, uh, you know, the family owned the, the whole complex. The company was shut down due to the COVID and uh, this person just opened up the place for us. And, uh, you know, we, there, was, there was this company with uh, 500 employees and the, the, the building was completely shut. And, um, you know, I did the first experiments on the Friday at the gas company and on the Monday morning we showed up and they opened up the place for us and we had 10, 15 people working for us. Fantastic, thank you. Um, it looks like we don't have any more questions in the Q&A, but I had a quick question for you, Ravi. Um, I'm kind of an agriculture person myself, so I'd love to kind of hear about the uh, intersection between physics and agriculture that you've come across uh, while working in India. So, yeah, well, I think, uh, uh, so there is an agrarian crisis, uh, you know, currently in India. So, uh, so farming is not uh, remunerative for the, uh, you know, many of the many of farmers in India, small farmers, and farming is not remunerative uh, for them. And uh, and there is also a big corporate interest in grabbing the control of farming in India. So, so I think there is a lot of uh, uh, a lot of this going on. Uh, so, so as far as, uh, uh, you know, uh, the groups that we work in India, they are, uh, they are uh, a lot uh, focused on sustainable agriculture, organic farming, 
you know, uh, the, those kind of ideas, especially, and those make sense for small farmers because those are labor intensive and small farmers in India typically have a lot of personal labor that they can offer uh, on their, their farms. There are states in India, at least one state in India, that is completely shifted to organic farming. It's a small state, Sikkim, uh, where the state has made a decision uh, that uh, all farming in Sikkim would be organic farming. So, so I would say, uh, you know, I would say that in India, uh, we are having multiple problems right now in uh, multiple issues right now, challenges in agriculture that, that volunteers from our group, Association for India's Development, uh, uh, you know, that we are facing. So one of the people who returned did his master's in electrical engineering from the US, went back to India, and he is working, his name is Kiran, and he's working, uh, you know, on agricultural issues. So other than saying that it's a complicated problem uh, with, uh, uh, you know, uh, where the equations are not just working out, like if you do back, see what I don't understand as a physicist, is why the farmer should be paid so low when there is so much value addition on every agriculture commodity that we use uh, uh, that the final price that the consumer pays is so high, but the cut for the farmer is always very, very low. So the amount the farmer gets from the French fries you, you buy, the amount the cotton farmer gets from the t-shirt that you buy, the amount the farmer gets from uh, what you eat in the restaurant is, is just like in pennies, uh, you know, and, and this is why the farmer is not, uh, you know, able to uh, sustain their living in India. And this is always a surprise how the system fleeces uh, the last, uh, you know, the, la the, pers the people at the bottom. Really, there's no safety net for them. Uh, and, the, and the market economy essentially just drives everything low. So that, uh, so that, uh, so, and uh, to other point that it just doesn't make sense when there is so much value addition, so much, the final price is so high compared to the price that the farmer is paid. Uh, the, you know, uh, it, then it doesn't make sense that, uh, that they are free. I mean, you double the price of the farmer, uh, they would be extremely happy and, and most of the problems would be solved. Uh, the double the price for the farmer, but, and that wouldn't change the final cost price much. Uh, final sale price of the products much, but yet it is something that the economic system is unable to do. So how, for example, the rights of the people are protected when the market economy essentially is driving things so that the basic rights are not protected, right, of the, of the labor force. I think that is a major problem that the agriculture situation seen in India is grappling with. It doesn't really much have to do with agriculture, uh, directly, but but it's what the farmers are getting, and I believe a small uh, small farmers in the U.S. also are in uh, you know face similar problems, and not just in India. Thank you very much, Ravi. Uh, looks like we got another question here in the Q and A that it's for either or both of you. Um, do you see a role for physics education to help students understand social implications, applications, and responsibilities of a physicist? I would say yes. Yeah, I think that's an excellent question. I would definitely also say yes for the various things that you know we have discussed here, and uh, and once again, I think that uh, the voices of people are important. Like, uh, for example, in countries like India, and it would be much worse in countries that even don't have that kind of freedom that India has. Uh, but even the freedom in India is so limited that if you have scientists even in established institutions like India speaking out on something uh, you know that the government doesn't like, uh, then they could be penalized for for doing that. They could lose their job. They could be warned. Uh, and, and and so I think uh, educating uh, you know both the uh, you know not only the the students of physics on human rights or on societal problems. But actually, building uh, that education in the entire system of policymakers uh, is important because I think these fundamental freedoms of being able to speak are important in physics. I mean, you, you uh, like, for example, S. Chandra Shaker, uh, I think that the story of uh, you know, how the research he did was not appreciated, if I'm not mistaken, by Eddington, who was his advisor. And 
uh, and then he had the guts to stand up and say that he was speaking the right thing. So he was, you know, talking the right thing about the Chandrasekhar limit and things like that. Uh, now I could be a little bit wrong in in my memory on the story, but uh, but uh, but yeah, the ability to you know take a stand and to say what you feel is at the heart of science, uh, and it's not you do not stoop to whether it's the religious powers of the past, whether it's the church or the state. The scientist is somebody who has the freedom to explore and to say the truth, and that basic freedom is missing in institutes of a lot of countries, including in India, a, a democracy like India, and probably much worse in other countries which are not democracies. Thank you very much. Um, it looks like we're almost to the end of the hour, so we might have time for one more quick question um, for either speaker. Are there areas or problems where you believe physicists could help uh, address or tackle but they are not currently doing so. So in other, er in other words, are there areas or specific problems you feel physicists are uniquely qualified to impact but are not doing so now? I think uh, climate change, uh, you know, one of the themes uh, for today's uh, talk, which was mentioned, I think when we are looking at these problems, we should look at the most important and pressing problems. Uh, and I feel this year's Nobel Prize to physics, which kind of uh, you know recognized the work of uh, climate scientists, was a very good step uh, in uh, focusing on uh, on climate. Uh, so, uh, so the fact that uh, you know this is what the next generation on Earth has to deal with, uh, I do think that a lot more scientists have to come out. Uh, and, uh, and 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 talk about climate change and suggest uh, you know solutions because a lot of dialogue and policy otherwise is probably going to be dictated by the economics of how the European Union and the uh, and the and the US their economics competes as to what steps they would take and what emerging economies like China and India what they can do but 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 I think uh, like at a broad level it's important to create that awareness in society on the on every in everybody as well as to come up with solutions for climate change uh, and i think much more needs to be done by physics since this is recognized as an extremely urgent uh, uh, urgent problem and the clock is ticking so i think physics need need to do much more on climate change thank you very much unfortunately that's all the time we have for today's webinar um, if anyone had questions that we didn't get to, I'd encourage you to follow up by email at webinars at aps.org, and we'll forward your questions to our speakers. Once again, I want to thank everyone for attending, and a big thank you to both of our speakers today, um, and we do hope to see you at our next broadcast. American Physical Society, copyright 2021, all rights reserved. Thank you for having us. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you, everybody. Hi, Chris.